If you have your Bibles, you can turn to that classic Christmas passage, passage Psalm 23. No, it's not a classic <laughs> Christmas passage at all, but you can still turn to Psalm 23. Uh, there was a beggar standing on the street corner uh, talking to his friend saying, If only I had a hundred dollars, I would never complain again in my life. A wealthy businessman uh, overheard him saying that. He said, uh, excuse me, did you say if I only had $100, uh, I would never complain the rest of my life? And he said, yes, sir, that's, that's correct. And so the wealthy businessman gives uh, the, the beggar $100 and goes on his way feeling good that he was able to uh, help out, do a small part in this world. Uh, and then after the man walked away, the beggar turns to his friends and he says, I wish I had asked for 200 uh, If only I had asked for $200. Uh, that's like some of us on, on Christmas, right? I, if only I'd asked for something bigger uh, or something better, maybe I would finally uh, be content. I would finally find satisfaction. Now, we know that contentment is not found in things. Uh, you're not going to unwrap uh, a present on Christmas morning that is going to finally bring you that contentment or that satisfaction that you're looking for because true contentment is found only in Jesus Christ. Uh, And that is what we've been looking at uh, this Christmas season, the star of Christmas, Jesus Christ. And today we look at Jesus Christ as the Good Shepherd. And we're going to look at that in Psalm uh, 23, because that's where true contentment is found, in the Good Shepherd. You're probably familiar with this psalm. It's one of the most well-known passages in the Bible. Um, John 3.16, Psalm 23. Uh, You probably heard it, used it uh, during times of difficulty. Uh, But it's also a psalm of confident contentment in the Lord as your shepherd. It's located in a a trio of psalms, 22 showing Christ as a suffering servant, talking about his death on the cross. Uh, 23, talking about him as the good shepherd, looking at his uh, care for us with his crook. And then uh, in 24, it shows Jesus as the sovereign king, focusing on his crown. Uh, Let's look at Psalm 23 this morning. It says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can spend together, and we thank you for your word. We thank you for the privilege that we have to open it up. And we thank you for your spirit that you give us to, ena- who you, uh, give us to enable us to live according to your word. And we pray that as we look at this psalm, that we might be drawn to our shepherd, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That we might find true contentment in him. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. And so in this psalm, we find that contentment is found in the good shepherd, Jesus Christ. And it gives us three main reasons why contentment is found in Jesus Christ and in Christ alone. But before we look at that, we want to look at this first verse that says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Because this is really the theme. Uh, The Lord is my shepherd. Contentment begins with our shepherd. And so who is the shepherd? Well, I've kind of alluded to it. But David here says, the Lord, and that's in all caps. That is Yahweh, the self-existent God who needs no one. That is the shepherd. And so that's what David says, Yahweh is my shepherd. And Jesus Christ is that same Lord. He says in John 8, 58, uh, I am. Yahweh is literally, he is which would be the third person, whereas I am is first person, saying I am. So Jesus is saying he is that very same God. So throughout the Bible, we see God painted as a shepherd, pictured as a shepherd. Uh, The shepherd image was very common uh, in in the ancient Near East, most likely because it was one of the most uh, prevalent jobs out there. Um, But it was also uh, a difficult job, um, and it was not uh, highly respected job either. Uh, One Bible scholar wrote, shepherds had to live with their sheep 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
Their task was unending. Day and night, summer and winter, fair weather, poor weather, lightning storms, freezing nights, they fed, they guided, they protected their sheep. And then the the commenter says, who in their right mind would choose to be a shepherd? Well, God calls himself our shepherd. The term also uh, became used more broadly to speak of kings and also to point to the Messiah who was to come. And of course, Jesus Christ identifies himself in John chapter 10, verse 11, as the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. He's called the chief shepherd in 1 Peter 5, 4. And then in Hebrews 13, 20, he's called the great shepherd. So God is the shepherd. Jesus Christ is the shepherd. But why do we need a shepherd? Well, Matthew 9, 36, uh, talking of Jesus, it says, but when he saw the multitudes, when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. So the Bible paints people like sheep. Uh, God is seen as the shepherd and people are seen as sheep, which if you know anything about sheep, which I didn't know a whole lot about sheep, uh, but I did a lot of uh, studying this week about sheep. And uh, one of the books that I read was uh, Philip Keller's book, uh, A Shepherd's Look at Psalm 23. So I'll be alluding to that uh, throughout this. But what I've read is sheep are some of the most fearful and timid creatures. They have no way of defending themselves. And so what they do is run. Uh, anything that comes, anything that spooks, I'm out of here. Maybe some of us are like that, I don't know. They lack any sense of direction, and so they wander away and they can't find their way back because they don't stop to ask for directions, right? Uh, But they can. They don't clean themselves, and they're content to stay dirty. They're just happy to be dirty. Uh, They also get into what we might call a mob mentality. One sheep goes one way, okay. He must know something that I don't, so let's go. Uh, they'll follow each other into dangerous situations. They don't discern what they eat sometimes or what they drink, often to their own peril. So sheep are pretty much dependent on their shepherd. And that's what God says we're like. Uh, and we can see the spiritual connection clearly that we are completely dependent on the shepherd as well. Uh, we often lack a sense of direction. Uh, we can wander aimlessly through life, content to live in sin, uh, willing to follow anyone or anything who seems like they know what they're doing. And we allow dangerous and sinful things into our lives as well. And so the idea here is that without Christ, we are like sheep in need of a shepherd too. We need the good shepherd in our lives. In Isaiah 53, 6, it says, All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We all have, or we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And the Lord laid on the good shepherd the iniquity of us all. And so David is telling us here that true contentment, confident living, is found in the good shepherd. And this is only applicable if the Lord is your shepherd. I know a lot of people uh, use this psalm um, for comfort, even if they're not believers. But the comfort really comes if you are a believer, if the Lord is my shepherd, if you can sit here today and say, the Lord is my shepherd, then this is for you. Because in John uh, chapter 10, verses 25 and following, Jesus answers these, these Jews that had come to him, and they, said, they say to him, how long are you going to make us doubt? If you are the Christ, just, just tell us already. Uh, and then Jesus says, I, I told you, and you believe not. You believe not the works that I do in my Father's name. They, they bear witness of me, but you believe not because you're not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. And so Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. They follow me. They're the ones that have eternal life. They're the ones that are secure in their eternity. And so it's talking about our salvation, following Jesus Christ. And so the question is, have you turned from your sinful ways? Have you turned from sin to Jesus Christ as your Savior? Are you following the Good Shepherd? Is Jesus Christ your shepherd here this morning? Are you one of His sheep? Because the rest of the passage, the contentment that's seen here, is only, only applies to you if the Lord is your shepherd. It doesn't defla- apply to every one of them. And so David says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now it's been said that the Sunday school student uh, accidentally quoted the verse this way, saying, the Lord is my shepherd, and that's all I want. And that's a good way to read it, really. 
I mean, it may not be accurate, but, but it's a good interpretation because if the Lord is your shepherd, you don't need anything else. He is all we need. And so that's what this passage is about. In Jesus Christ, we have everything we need because he has given his life for the sheep. And Now, if you know anything about David, you know he was a man who, who faced his share of trouble and his, fa- his share of danger. He dealt with people that were trying to kill him, oftentimes. Running uh, for his life, facing hardship and anguish. And he says, in Jesus Christ, I, I have ever, all I want. And the, and the Lord is my shepherd. I'm not lacking in anything. And so if you're here this morning and, and maybe you're, there's an emptiness or, or a loneliness or depression or frustration in your life, ask yourself, where is my focus? Is it on my shepherd? Is it on the good shepherd or is it on me and my stuff? Is my focus on uh, the president or, or the government or, or, or my spouse or, or my children or my job or anything else? If something else is shepherding you, you can't say, I'm content. If your focus is on me and this world and my stuff, then I will never be satisfied. But if my focus is on Jesus Christ, on the good shepherd, then I can say like David, I have all I want. I have all I need. We are to be content in Jesus Christ. We don't need anything else. It reminds me of a story I read, uh, a short story, of an elderly Puritan who sat down to dinner to find one potato and a glass of water. He looked at his meal and he said, with profound gratitude, all this and Jesus Christ too. And that's the right attitude. In Jesus Christ, we have everything. We can be content because He has met our greatest need. He gave His life for the sheep. And so that's the point David makes here. And then he's going to go on and tell us some reasons why we can find contentment in our Good Shepherd. And the first one is the Good Shepherd provides for His sheep. In verse 2, we see that He provides spiritual nourishment. It says, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. The making me lie down is an interesting phrase, the first, when I first read it, I think of what I have to do with my dogs to get them to lay down sometimes, because you know, like, lay down, and then they don't do it, so you got to push them down. Um, that's what instantly pops into my mind, but really what he's saying is he causes me to lie down in green pastures, and what I read is that it's pretty near impossible to get a sheep to lie down unless four requirements are met. The first one is they need to be free from fear. Uh, Secondly, they need to be free from conflict, so they can't be fighting with each other. Third, they need to be free from pests, bugs and stuff. Who doesn't like that? And then fourth, they need to be fed and full. Essentially, their needs have to be met. Um, And so here, the idea is the green pastures is more talking about the food. But, But the sheep has to have its needs met in order to feel secure enough to lie down. And that's what uh, David is talking about here. The the good shepherd, uh, the Lord as your shepherd, has brought you to green pastures and led you beside the still waters so that you're 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 full. You can you can lie down in rest. And so, I don't know. I didn't know this before either. But most sheep countries in the world are basically dry because I guess sheep do better in that type of environment. There are less pests. <laughs> And there are various other reasons for that. But that's the type of terrain you would have found in in Bethlehem. And so to get green pastures, the shepherd has to do a lot of work to produce those green pastures, those those green grasslands. And and, uh, Phil Keller writes, If the sheep were to enjoy green pastures amidst the brown, barren hills of Bethlehem, the shepherd had a tremendous job to accomplish. And so David says here that the good shepherd has caused me to lie down in these green pastures. That is, he has provided the food for me that I need so that I can be content, so that I can find the rest that I need. And it's, this passage is all about the shepherd and what he does for his sheep. And so Jesus Christ supplies for us all that we need. And in first and second Peter uh, 1, 3, it says he's, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Christ has provided His life. He gives us His Word. He's given us His Holy Spirit so that we can live this life. So that we can have everything that we need as long as we are following Him. Because a hungry sheep is not going to lie down. 
They're going to stay on their feet searching for something, something else, something more, kind of like maybe before you go to bed sometimes you're, you're downstairs or in the kitchen looking in the refrigerator, I need to find something else to eat before I go to bed. It's the same way with the sheep. As long as they're hungry, they're going to stay on their feet, rummaging, searching for one more mouthful, and they're not going to thrive. They're constantly looking for something that will satisfy. Well, Christ has given us what we need to satisfy us. He's given us His Word to feast on. He says that man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That is in His Word. And and He has given that to us to feast on. Are we feasting on the Scriptures? The Bible also says, it equates the word to, to meat and, and to milk uh, that, that a baby desires. Uh, and the Bible says to eat it up, to eat up his word. Are we eating it up today? Are we filling, up, uh, filling our lives on, on junk, the things that won't satisfy? Things that as soon as we eat them, we need something else because it, it's not uh, the meal that, that we need. The shepherd provides the food so that the sheep can lie down so that the sheep can find rest. And it goes on to say, <clears throat> he leads me beside the still waters. And another writer who, who knows more about sheep than I do said, sheep won't get close to running fast-moving water because if they fall or if they get pushed in, their heavy coat will get soaked and then they will fall under. So they're, I said they were scared. And so when sheep are thirsty, much like when they're hungry, they become impatient and they become restless. Uh, and then they set out on a quest for water on their own. And they'll drink from potholes, polluted potholes, and things where uh, that might be contaminated by various things. Uh, and so then they'll, they'll drink that, and they'll pick up parasites and germs and diseases. And don't we do that sometimes? Where we're looking for something to satisfy us, and instead of spending the time with God, spending time in His Word and prayer, uh, well, I'll just go do this. Right, uh, maybe something else will, will, will satisfy my, di- my desires or, or, or maybe something else could be a quick fix you know, some people turn to drugs some people it's alcohol uh, some people maybe it's a relationship uh, it could be any number of things that we substitute for what we really need which is God and his word uh, and the Holy Spirit working through his word David says here it's the good shepherd who knows where the still calm and clean waters can be found And it's that water that will satisfy the sheep and produce strong and healthy sheep. Jesus says in John chapter 7, in verses 38 and 39, Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So Jesus, our good shepherd, provides the living water for us. He provides the Holy Spirit for us who enables us to live the Christian life. In Ephesians 5.18, it tells us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That is, we are to be yielded to Him. And we yield to Him as we obey God's Word. And the Spirit works in us a desire to do God's will. It produces Christ-like character in us. He gives us comfort. He empowers us to bear witness. So if you want true contentment, we must learn to walk by the Spirit as we read the Word of God. In Christ, we have everything. That's the idea here. And that's what we see in this passage. That it's only in Christ that we have salvation. It's only in Christ that we've been given peace with God. It's in Christ and His Word and His Spirit that we can be satisfied in this life. And the reason why we lack contentment oftentimes is because we're looking for other things. We're not eating uh, the food that God has provided for us. We're trying to fill our time on maybe social media, TV, uh, maybe it's politics, sports, money, fame, relationships, whatever it may be. Those things are not ultimately going to satisfy us. It's only when we feast on the green pastures of God's Word and, uh, that we can find contentment. It's like uh, on Christmas. I don't know what uh, everybody eats in here for Christmas dinner. Uh, maybe you have turkey, maybe you have ham uh, with potatoes, uh, stuffing, I don't know. Uh, probably not with ham, I don't know. Uh, Chinese food, I don't know, that's what we do. Um, and then you have some dessert, uh, and then you get a, maybe then you get a phone call from a family member saying, hey, I'm running late, but I'm bringing uh, a lasagna. You're like, no, I'm stuffed. You know, I don't even want to think about food. I'll be right over. 
Do you want that? No. And then maybe if you're a teenager, right? Maybe, maybe you want it. Um, or if you're a professional weightlifter or something. Uh, but what sounds, to good, what sounds good to you then? A nap, right? You want to sleep because you're full. And at that moment, you don't want to even think about food again. And so when you're full, you don't have a desire of anything else. And that's the idea. Uh, David says, the Lord is my shepherd. I don't need anything else. I'm full. If I were to die, I'd be the richest man in the world. Because I have Jesus Christ, I have my shepherd. And Jesus Christ provides for us spiritual nourishment. He also provides spiritual restoration. It says in verse 3, He restoreth my soul. Then it goes on to say, He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Restoration means to bring back to its original state. Only with Jesus, uh, I imagine it's better than the original state. Kind of like those fixer-upper shows um, on... HDTV and, and such. And they'll take a broken down house. Uh, the more run down, the better. Uh, and then they'll fix it up to make it look better than it did before. And that's what Jesus Christ does with us. And so it says here, the Good Shepherd restores our souls in times of depression, in times of discouragement, in distress. When we're cast down, the Good Shepherd will restore our souls. And Psalm 42, 11 says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise Him, my salvation and my God. Cast down is an English shepherd term that refers to when a sheep has fallen over and got stuck on its back. Uh, maybe you've seen beetles or, or maybe your toddler when he's all in his um, winter gear falls down and he just can't get up. and he's, he, That's what happens to sheep. Uh, they will fall down and kick their legs frantically and not be able to get back up. And it will stay there in frustration, lashing out. And if the shepherd doesn't come in a timely manner, the sheep will die. Because gases that build up in its stomach. Also, they're, all, they're, they're an easy target for predators when they're on its back. So the, the shepherd has to be on the lookout. And that's why good shepherds will constantly be watching out, counting their sheep. That's what we, I used to do when we did day camp. Uh, when, we did, uh, when I worked at a camp, it was like always counting the kids because kids will wander away too, just like the sheep. And so the good shepherd is always on the lookout for a sheep because when one's missing, the first thought is, oh no, he's, he's cast. He's upside down and he can't get up. He needs my help. And no sheep is immune to this, I read. It happens to the strongest sheep, the biggest sheep, and sometimes even the healthiest sheep. And this serves as a warning to each one of us. We're not immune to falling. In 1 Corinthians 10:12, it says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he stand take heed lest he fall. We're all prone to wander, as the hymn says, Come thou fount. As God's sheep, we can stray from the path that he's called us to walk in. We can lose focus, taking our eyes off the shepherd and focusing it on some, something or someone else in order to, that, that somebody else might meet our perceived needs, to meet our, our sinful habits or whatever, and we wind up on our backs in need of restoration. Because oftentimes our focus is so much on our own kingdoms, our own lives, that we become anxious, we become depressed, we become angry, critical, and it spirals out of control from there, and then we wind up falling on our backs somewhere. And it's important and we need the Good Shepherd to come at that time to restore us before the enemy, the roaring lion, comes and devours us. And so what would happen is the shepherd, when he finds the sheep, he would gently pick them up, roll them up onto his feet, and then he'd rub the sheep's legs to get circulation back into the legs. Then the sheep would anxiously, or, or, or too zealously, I guess, try to go walk on his own, but then he would stumble and stagger and fall back down. So then the sheep would come alongside again and, and talk to a sheep, like we all talk to our animals, same thing. And they would still you know, rub them and, uh, and get them so that the sheep could walk on its own. And then it would regain its equilibrium, walk on its own, and then bound off and join the rest of the flock. And that's what the Good Shepherd does with us, with his sheep. He compassionately, patiently works with his sheep and mercifully gets us back on our feet when we fall and restoring our souls. And if you've ever thought that I've done this too many times, God has got to be frustrated with me. He's got to be fed up with me by now. He probably hates me and doesn't want anything to do with me now. The picture here is the Good Shepherd is gracious and, and kind and gentle and loving. 
and He patiently is going to work with you and, and restore you and pick you back up on your feet that you might join the rest of the flock. That's the image here. And that's what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will do with us. Graciously bring us back. And how does God do that? How does the Good Shepherd do that? He uses three main sources. He uses His Word. Psalm 19.7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. That word reviving is the same thing as restoring. It is His Word that shows us where we've wandered off track and how to get back on track. 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and for correction, and also for instruction in righteousness. We also, uh, He uses the church. We looked at that in the book of James. The God has entrusted those who are spiritual the ministry of using the Word, using prayer, uh, to help straying sheep. To get them back on track. Lovingly, graciously, and patiently bearing with one another to get other believers back on their feet the same way Jesus Christ does with us. And of course, He uses the Holy Spirit. Because as the church, as the body of believers does uh, their work, and as the Scripture does its work, the Holy Spirit works in our hearts and our minds to get us back on our feet. So the Good Shepherd provides for us. We can be content because He provides for us. He provides spiritual nourishment, He provides spiritual restoration, and He provides spiritual guidance. Uh, It says, He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake, at the end of verse 3. The word paths here literally means wagon tracks. Or as one scholar says, even more literally, ruts. Now usually when we think of ruts, we think of them as bad things. Like I'm stuck in a rut or or I'm in a rut. Uh, It's a negative connotation. But here we see ruts can be a good thing. Uh, When they're ruts of righteousness, they're a good thing. And that's where the shepherd wants us. He wants us in ruts of righteousness. Uh, Because we are prone to follow others instead of following God. And that's the same thing that is true with sheep. Sheep are just as quick to follow other sheep as they are to follow their shepherd. Uh, I read of one incident that happened in 2005 uh, from one shepherd. He says, first one sheep jumped to its death, and then another, and another, and then dozens more. Having left their herds to graze while they ate their breakfast, stunned Turkish shepherds now watched as nearly 1,500 sheep leapt off the same cliff. The first 450 died. The others survived because they landed on the other sheep. Um, The tragedy happened plainly because the sheep were allowed to wander onto a wrong trail, unaware of what lay ahead of them. One simply followed the other all the way off the cliff. And so what happens is one sheep gets on a different trail, and then they're all doomed. The blind leading the blind. And so good shepherds will make sure that the sheep are walking on the right path. And for us, the Good Shepherd makes sure that we are walking in the ruts of righteousness, which is why He's given us His Word. And so, are we reading our Bibles? Are we walking in ruts of righteousness? We've got to develop daily habits of righteousness. And one of those is obviously reading your Bible and obeying it. Uh, We read in 2 Timothy 3.16 that it's profitable for instruction in righteousness. So how to walk rightly, how to live rightly. And it doesn't do us any good if we don't obey what we read, so we have to obey it as well. That's how we stay in the ruts of righteousness. We pray. Are you praying? The Bible says to pray without ceasing, to have continual communion with God. And so we read the Bible, we we pray, we develop those spiritual disciplines, as we call them, because we're to discipline ourselves toward godliness. Because godliness doesn't happen by chance, it doesn't happen by accident. We don't fall out out of bed being more godly. We have to work at it. And we use our gifts to serve in the local church. That's what God wants us to do. The church isn't just about us. It's about how we can build each other up. It's not about necessarily what I get out of it, but what am I putting into it? Are we giving? Are we, are we sharing Christ with others? These are the ruts of righteousness. And so the Good Shepherd provides for us. He provides uh, our nourishment. He provides restoration. He provides guidance. Secondly, the Good Shepherd protects his sheep. And in verse 4 it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The valley of the shadow of death in Hebrew is literally the valley of deep shadows or deep darkness. The Hebrew doesn't, the Hebrew doesn't necessarily mean death, but it could definitely refer to that. Um, sheep, 
as I mentioned, are by nature timid, timid animals. It's been said that just the sudden bounding of a jackrabbit out from a bush is enough to to scare one of them and then send the whole flock running. Because remember, they don't defend themselves, they just run. Don't ask questions, just get out of here. Um, And that's kind of what we do. I saw a video uh, the other day of, I don't know if it was Facebook, of a guy just running. Uh, like, and then he would tap somebody on the shoulder and then everybody else would start running. No reason. Nobody was chasing them. It was just an experiment because we do the same thing. Uh, but the sheep would just run. Uh, and so dark, valleys of dark shadows can be a scary place for sheep. But sometimes the shepherd has to lead the sheep through those valleys. As Phil, Philip Keller points out, it says, the valley is usually the most gentle route to the higher summer feeding grounds. Also, valleys have the best source of water and thus provide the best feeding spots on the way to higher ground. Though the valley may be scary, it is often the best way to find refreshment and nourishment that the sheep need. And because the shepherd is with them, there is no need to be afraid. Now, God often takes us through scary times, uh, hard times, in order that we might find that higher ground. And the same, the illustration uh, applies to the spiritual life. And, and our shadows can be, uh, our valley can be any dark situation that you find yourself in. Maybe it's a sickness. Maybe it's, maybe it's sadness. Maybe it's, it's any situation in where, where you face the unknown. Because that's always scary. Unemployment, death of a loved one. Any kind of trial that you're facing can be a, a valley of deep shadows. But David says, though he walks in those situations, though he faces dark situations, and he certainly did, he says, I will fear no, fear, fear no evil. He says, I can go through the most dangerous, most difficult, most trying of times, but I'm not going to fear any evil. Why? Because my shepherd is with me. My Lord is with me. The good shepherd is with me. And we have that same promise. In Hebrews 13, it says, Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? So whatever we may go through, whatever dark times, whatever valley we may be facing today, God is with you if He is your shepherd. The good shepherd is there every step of the way, taking you to higher ground, whatever that may be for you. Ultimately, it's glorification in heaven with Jesus Christ. It's Christ-likeness, right? We know that all things work together for good. To those who love Him. It's producing maturity. It's, it's, it's bringing us closer to our Lord and Savior. That's what God is doing in our lives. No matter what you may be going through today, you're not alone. Because if you're a believer, if you're one of His sheep, the Good Shepherd is right there with you. And that is comforting. Even in evangelism. One of the scariest things we have to do. Jesus promises that I'm going to be with you. Uh, For example, one night, uh, missionary David Livingston found himself in the heart of Africa, surrounded by angry people, hostile tribes. And he said he wanted to run. He wanted to escape. He wanted to get out of there. But then he remembered, go therefore and teach all nations, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. And years later, when he received an honorary doctorate from the University of Glasgow, he says, would you like me to tell you what got me through all of those years, all, this, all those times when I feared because people were hostile toward me, things that I didn't understand? How did I get through it? It was this, lo, I am with you always. On those words, I, sta- I staked everything and they never failed. The presence of the Good Shepherd can make us content even in times of fear because we don't have to deal with it alone. And so the shepherd is with us. He says, and then uh, also he's comforted because uh, it says in uh, verse 4, you are with me and thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The rod was used, of course, to protect the sheep from danger. Uh, The shepherd would use his rod to to fight off predators uh, like coyotes, wolves, and and the like. Uh, And often used to to, uh, get snakes and other dangerous creatures away from the sheep. But it also was often used to discipline wayward sheep, to protect them from themselves, uh, which can also be a danger. And sometimes we need that as well. Our children, uh, there's the obvious uh, analogy as we are called to shepherd our our children, uh, and sometimes using the rod uh, for correction, for discipline. Uh, And one writer said the rod is used for this purpose perhaps more than any other, disciplining wayward sheep. And, And that provides a comfort for the sheep. 
And so if the shepherd saw a sheep wandering or getting too close to danger, the rod would be used to send the, the sheep back where it belonged. The staff also um, used, was used for a similar reason, but it was more to pull the sheep close to the shepherd. It was, it was representative of compassion uh, and comfort, uh, where the rod might show uh, authority and, and protection and discipline. And so the rod and the staff would comfort the sheep. And, and so uh, Christ comforts us the same way, that he's going to pull us close to himself. And he may have to discipline us sometimes in the process if we get too far out, but that should bring comfort to us, knowing, for one, that we are his child, it tells us in, in Hebrews uh, 13. And so we find comfort knowing that the shepherd is there for us, that he will protect us, that he will discipline us if we need it. And so the good shepherd provides for us. He protects us. And lastly, he pours out his grace on his sheep. In verses 5 and 6, it says, Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so the picture kind of changes here from a shepherd to a, a gracious host throwing a banquet and sparing no expense, no extravagance for the invited guests. And he says, my cup runneth over, my cup overflows indicating that, that God had given him an abundance, even in the presence of his enemies, it says. And he expects grace and mercy to be with him all the days of his life. The image of anointing the head with oil, we, we talked about a little bit when we were in James. It was used to, to refresh and to soothe. It speaks of a host graciously welcoming somebody into their home. And so David is basically saying that because of these abundant riches of God's grace, he's always welcome in the presence of the Lord. And the same thing is true of us as believers, as His sheep. Paul says it this way in Ephesians 2. He says, But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And so if the Lord is your shepherd, you can be content because you will be feasting at His banqueting table forever. You will be in the presence of the Lord for the rest of your life. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And he says in verse 6, and you notice David's confidence here as he says it, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And this is a wonderful image because you think about David... You think about his life, and he's constantly on the run. He's constantly be, be being pursued by enemies. Right? They're the ones that are following him, or his, his enemies. But what does he say here? He says, even though my enemies may follow after me, I know something greater is pursuing me. Something more wonderful, something more marvelous, and that is God's goodness and mercy. It's following after me all the days of my life, which is much better than the enemies that are following he knows that he is forever in the protection and provision of the shepherd who is willing to pour out his grace on the sheep. And I, I, think, of, I think of Jonah in his pursuit. I mean, in God's pursuit of Jonah. Jonah ran, but God pursued him. Even though he wanted to get as far away from God's will as possible, God went after him. God pursued him. And that's what David is kind of saying here. Even though my enemies are chasing after me, but God is pursuing me. His goodness, His grace, His mercy is following after me. And His mercy is following after you as well. The good shepherd has given you this same assurance. If He is your shepherd, if you are His sheep, you can be content, you can be confident in this world. No matter what is going on in your life. No matter what shadows, no matter what darkness may be out there. No matter who's pursuing you, God is there. God is with you. God is pursuing you. And He's given you everything you need in Jesus Christ. And He's given you salvation. He's given you His Word. He's given you His Spirit. He protects you. He restores you. And He has graciously poured out His blessing on each and every one of us who have placed our trust in Him. So the question is, are you finding your contentment in Him? 
If the Lord is your shepherd, you have all you need. And if the Lord is your shepherd, you can say like the Sunday schooler, I have all I want. Because you do. My, I pray that the Lord is your shepherd here today, and I pray that you are finding satisfaction and contentment in Him, because you're not going to find it anywhere else. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Let's pray.